everyone. This is Knowledge is Power. I'm Wanda Miller. I'm the host. This week, my guest is Ann Clark, Hi. sitting here with me, and she is the executive director of Hope Street, Hope Street Garden and Learning Lab, among other things. And we're going to have a really good discussion. Ann has brought along some pictures and some video, so we're going to have a, a real good discussion. Um, of course, I'm going to go through my awards like I do every week, and, and of course, there's a uh, you know, the, the, the Trump Meister is giving everybody something to talk about, so I have something to talk about uh, pertaining to him this week as well. So first of all, let me start off with the Golden Hammer Award. And this week, I'm going to give the Golden Hammer Award to Jackie, who is a representative from the York AAA, uh, York AAA. LA, out on Eastern Boulevard. Jackie is an incredible rep over there. She has been so helpful to me, and she deserves a Golden Hammer. Um, and, and I'm going to explain why she deserves the Golden Hammer. You know, last week I talked about the PennDOT and I gave them the rusty nail um, for, you know, among other things, the fact that they have not been sending out the renewals for the disability placards to people who need them. And so people are being forced to expedite the process of getting a placard and they, they generally go to the AAA and they have to pay a $10 fee, which the reason AAA charges the fee is because PennDOT charges a fee. So they have to charge a fee to compensate for the fee that PennDOT is collecting. So um, I talked to Jackie and Jackie has been really good. Um, I, I myself, because I have, I've, you know, I've been very uh, open about having PTSD and I also have fibromyalgia and I do have a placard myself and I've had this situation. I uh, went to Jackie, Jackie was wonderful, looked into it. The reason I didn't get my placard is because <laughs> they, PennDOT not only had the wrong driver's license, but sent it to a business out on West Market Street. That's why I didn't get mine. So Jackie was nice enough and she went through everything she needed to go through and cleared it up for me. So, you know, thumbs up to Jackie and a big rusty nail and a, a case of tetanus to PennDOT for not getting their act together for people that are you know disabled you know a lot of people that are disabled are on fixed income so that really is really sucks that you're basically forcing people to pay for something that should be free um okay so the next thing i'm going to do is you know I've, i have this little um friendly rivalry i guess i might say with susan burns now i i, I really do i really you know susan burns i give her all the credit in the world for standing up to about donald trump and she's been wonderful with veterans but Giving the gold coin to county employees that do good things, I'm I just, you know, I think county employees just need so much more than that. And, and it's a nice thought, but, you know, really, what they really need is better work situations. They need to have others, other um, uh, co uh, co-workers that are pulling their share of the weight instead of, you know, putting it all on them. You know, there are, I know county employees that have had budgets cut so drastically that, they are now doing the work of literally 10 people. And, and I'm not exaggerating, they're literally doing the work of 10 people because their staff has been cut that dr drastically. So that's where that comes from. It's no, you know, I'm not, not, I'm not you know, bashing Susan by any stretch of the imagination. I just think that they need more than a gold coin. But, you know, I have these little gold coins that I have been giving out to special people and I gave one out to Sonia last week um, the Ekia lady and by the way remember to keep liking that Facebook page for the Ekia it's it's capital E capital C capital Y capital E capital H P A so you have to pull it up like that and then like it but I'm gonna give a gold coin this week Thank to you. Ann Clark, who has done so much for the community, Thank you. and I know she's going to continue to do a lot for the community. <laughs> so that's my appreciation for everything that you're doing for every for the community, for the kids, for every everything that you do, and you will continue to do. I appreciate so thank that. You thank so you much. for my gold coin. You are welcome. <laughs> I have a place that I put all these things on my desk that people give me, and it is nice to look at them and remember. Yeah, it's you know, it's nice to be appreciated. It is, yeah. it really is. And we do appreciate you. Thank you. And I'm sure the kids really appreciate you. Well, I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, on to the next announcement. Um, 
Representative Kevin Schreiber is going to host a screening of The Hunting Ground, and that is a movie about sexual assault on uh, in, in college campuses. That's an important thing. It's an important movie. It's an important subject. Uh, if you can, please get out there. It's next week on Wednesday, October 19th at 5 o'clock at The Strand. Now, for those of you who work and you don't get off until 5, don't worry. You can still go because at 5 o'clock is a reception. Uh, from 5 to 6 is a reception. At 6 o'clock is a f the film and the panel discussion. Uh, they said that tickets are free and there's no need to RSVP in advance. However, I think if you have a group of 10 or more, they ask that you contact uh, Representative Schreiber's office and uh, contact Sully Pinos, which we, we know Sully, and uh, get, get talk to her about making arrangements. Um, you know, this is, I'm going to talk a little bit about Trump then and, and what's been going on with that, the whole, and the whole video thing with the sexual assault. So this is coming at a really, a really good time and it's such, it is such an important subject. Um, there's, there's plenty of parking after five downtown in the garages and in other areas. So don't let, don't let parking be a barrier, you know, make every attempt to get there because I think it's going to be really good. I'm definitely going to try to, to make that. Um, the next thing that's coming up is a film called Resilience, The Biology of Stress and Science of Hope. And that's going to be held Tuesday, October 25th. Uh, the doors will open at 6 p.m. The film's at 6.30. That's at Hannah Penn K-8 Auditorium. And this is a continuation of the trauma-informed care movement that is starting to go through York, which is, it's, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is so good to have this because Let's face it, our society sets people up for trauma. Yeah. You know, we have trauma. Putting people in prison is traumatic. Um, dragging them through court systems is traumatic. You know, the schools can be traumatic with bullying. So to move to a trauma-informed method of uh, methodology is, is just, it's, it's wonderful. And I'm, I'm so happy that it's happening. Back in February, we had the uh, Paper Tigers movie at, at Logos Academy. In May, we had the special event, the Trauma-Informed Care Conference Day, which Michelle Hovis and, and others uh, put together. Uh, that was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful training. And that was put and they did that for free. That was an amazing event. They did it, and they did it free purposely so that everyone, well, they, of course, they couldn't get, they had, they had so many people, they had to turn people away, but they, anyone who really wanted to participate, you could put your name in and hopefully get in, but if you could, if you got your name in there and you were, you were not the cutoff, you definitely got in, no matter, you know, if you were a family member, if you were actually working in the field, it didn't matter. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that, and I would encourage everyone to, to get out there and see this. I definitely, that's another must-do on my list. Um, even if I don't make the hunting ground one, I'm, I'm definitely going to make every attempt to go to resilience. But the hunting ground, both of them are important, so make every attempt to get out there. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is Josh Burkhalter is debating Scott Perry tonight. That happens at 7 p.m. at the Cross, Key, Cross Keys Village Night Carry Meeting House in New Oxford. And uh, uh, that should be an interesting debate. I have met Josh. I really, like, I really like him. He's a great guy. He's also very good looking. So we sort of have that, that, that John Kennedy thing going on there. <laughs> um, and I guess, you know, I shouldn't really be judging a candidate by their appearance, but he is really cute. Um, and he's he's going to be debating he's going to be debating Scott Perry and uh, really um, S S Scott Perry and Scott Wagner are both big supporters of Trump and I, I don't really need to say much more than that and you know Susan Burns even came out Susan Burns who is a Republican even came out against Trump because he was just so nasty to that military family the the um, the Muslim family uh, that. Had a, a had lost a, a son in the in the in the war and uh, just this you know just these horrible things that are being said it's just it's just not right so um, that being said we're going to move on to Trump and first you know the first thing I, I have to do is I have to put my little I have to put my little ears on here because I I have something to show everybody that is really <laughs> uh, maybe you've seen it online I actually found this on the uh, the 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 
Federation of York County Democratic Women, I think I said that right, sorry Deb if I didn't, but Deb Yannick is the president, Alana Haig is I believe vice president, but really great ladies, really, really nice. And they they posted this on their Facebook page and it says, um, it says, if I don't know if you can see it, probably can't see it, but it says, um, it has a, a little black cat like this. You can, you know, if you can see this, um, is it close enough? But it has this little black cat and it says uh, pussies against Trump uh, you can't you can't grab this um, <laughs> which I think I just love it <laughs> I wish they'd make t-shirts so um, I'm, I'm just gonna say the next then my my next little piece here I'm just gonna do with my ears on um, also with my my little my little white kitty and of course, uh, Stinky's back um, because, it, again, it's something that is so foul, the stench stays with it. First of all, um, I'm, I'm going to call this section Wanda's Rant. And I'm going to try not to do a rant every week, but this week it really war is warranted because of what happened with Trump. So for those of you who are, I don't know, living in a cave or you really have had so much, you're just so sick of the, the politics that you've just turned off your TV and unplugged it until the election is over and Ace is over there nodding his head. He's like, yeah, I don't want to deal with it anymore. So if you know if you if you're if you have if you're hiding under that rock and you don't want to hear anything, you know maybe now's the time to turn the TV off or to turn the computer off and not listen to this. But anyway, uh, last week it came out that Donald Trump and Billy Bush, who I believe Billy Bush is the host of uh, some entertainment show like Extra or I don't think I think it's Extra. I don't think it's Entertainment Tonight. So. Apparently, a couple years ago, they had they were on this bus going somewhere, and they uh, you would think Billy Bush, who is a host, would know when a mic is on and when a mic isn't, but apparently they didn't realize the mic was on. So the mic was on, and they were talking what they like to say is guy talk. And it was pretty, pretty raunchy, pretty raw, and you can find it all over the Internet, so I don't need to go in detail of what was said. But essentially, the, the, the big... Uh, you know the reason they're calling it uh, Pussygate is because Trump said something about yeah when when you're famous you can do anything you can grab their pussies you can kiss them you can do anything women will let you do anything when you're when you're powerful and you have and you're famous which really isn't true mr. Trump but you know we'll let you have your delusions so I want to talk a little bit about sexual assault because it is not a laughing matter uh, rape culture is real and before I start, I, I do want to put up the, Ace, can you put up the abuse hotline number, please? Um, earlier in the, in the year, I mean, maybe the third show uh, that we did, I had on uh, Kristen Woolley, who is the founder and director of Turning Point, which is an, an organization that is an advocacy and also helps women recover, women and teenage girls recover from sexual assault. And she came on the show with one of her therapists it was an amazing show very powerful they were there were so many statistics so many things that they talked about so i'm going to just go over some of the things that we talked about back then uh these are actually some some uh statistics and facts that i pulled off of their website which is uh that you can find it in turning if you go if you look up turning point york pa you can find that so first of all rape culture is real it is not a joke uh, one of the first facts here is about 20 million out of 112 million women, that's 18.0% in the United States have been raped during their lifetime. Think about that. Only 16% of all rapes were reported to law enforcement. Among college women, about 12% of rapes were reported to law enforcement. About 35% of women who were raped as adults compared to 14% of women I'm sorry, about 35% of women who were raped as adults compared to 14% of women without a, an early rape history. So 35% more women, if you were, if you were raped, if you were raped as an, oh wait, compared to 14% without, I must have written this wrong, sorry, give me a minute to figure this out. About 35% of women who were raped as adults compared to 14% of women without, okay, without a, an early history of rape. So that's comparing if you were raped as an adult versus if you were raped as, if you were raped early on, then you, you have a higher chance of being raped again. 
28% of male rape victims were first raped when they were 10 years old or younger. So we cannot forget that, that may, uh, men can be raped as well. Uh, approximately one in six boys and one in four girls are sexually abused before the age of 18. And I, you know, my personal take on this is that I think Mr. Trump seems to forget that a woman gave him life and without her, he would not be here to spew all this hate and all these other horrendous things that are coming out of his mouth. So maybe he should be thankful to women and respect them a little more since some, since a woman, some woman somewhere, you know, I would probably say that an unfortunate woman somewhere gave birth to this thing. And, uh, you know, um, yeah. So anyway, um, you know, I don't think Trump is fit to be president. I don't think um, Charles Wasco is fit to be mayor. And you know, I went to the the uh, council meeting the other week, and you know, yes, he needs to resign. So Mayor Wasco, you need to resign. You know, we haven't heard anything yet. So at some point, you need to step down because you're not fit, and neither is Trump. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, I, and think about this, like Trump is over 60. In most states, there are laws that allow for comp competency testing if an older adult acts irrationally. So maybe we as a collective voice need to demand that Trump undergo psychological testing to determine his fitness as a potential commander in chief. Because quite honestly, I don't want him as a commander in chief. He scares the living bejeebies out of me. Um, I think the Republican Party also needs to take needs to uh, take a firm stand stand and denounce Trump as president. I mean, I've seen a lot of Republicans coming out and saying, "You need to apologize, Donald Trump." No, Donald Trump needs to not apologize. Donald Trump needs to apologize for ever running for president and just step down and walk away with his head between his legs because he's horrible. He's just horrible, or his tail between his legs, or whatever. Whatever. Um, he just needs to stop. It, it's. This is just unconscionable that someone who could possibly be president is behaving this way. And, you know, there has to be something that can be done about this to, to see, you know, after this is like has to be like the final straw. When you are someone who could be elected president and you are espousing a rape culture, then, you know, yeah, you need to go. Um, there was also a, uh, the other thing that I found online, is kind of funny little story. There was a, a woman uh, who actually sent, um, this is, you know, if you have kids in the room, you might want to, you know, just shuffle them away um, quickly. But this woman, uh, as, a, as a protest, sent uh, some of the hair from down there, I'll put it that way, to Donald Trump in one of his little mailings that's asking for money. And her husband, agreed with it and it's a really funny story you know it sounds really raunchy and horrible but it's it's really funny and uh, she had his she actually put his address the the well the the organization that reported this put Trump's address uh, along with this article so if anybody wants to write him and I'm not saying that you should do what this woman said but you know, I don't think it's a bad idea to actually write the man and tell him that you don't agree with what he's saying and that you don't like it and to let your feel let let your feelings be heard in a in a you know, in a respectful way. Don't don't as President Obama has said when when they go low, we need to go high. So, you know, when they're going low, we need to step it up and we need to act more mature than their these people are acting. But anyway, can you put that up there for me, Ace, please? Um, it's it's Donald J. Trump and an ace um, question if the J stands for jackass, but you know that may be true. I don't know. Um, it says Donald J. Trump, President Inc. Uh, care of Trump Tower, seven two five Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, one zero zero two two. So um, that's my little rant for this week. And now we're going to get on to some happier things and we'll turn to my my guest Anne and we'll start talking about happy things like kids and parks and health equity yeah. yes and health equity yes so well i'm glad to be here you know i uh my passion is education and equity and and i'm doing a lot of stuff around economics this mm -hmm. year um you know there's a lot going on in york to try and change and make the city more walkable and playable livable and there's a lot of organizations working for that. E Play Breathe is one of them, who uh, 
puts a lot of effort into that and has done a lot to change the infrastructure of York. So I'm excited to see a lot of that. Mm -hmm. Well, you want to talk a little bit, and you also brought some videos. Yes, and you brought some videos. pictures. So, yeah. would you like to show show something first? Yeah, whatever you, whatever you'd like to bring up is fine. Uh, which one did you want to start with? Was well, we could start with like the day of discovery or okay. the beginning of Hope Street. Any of those? Do you want to? Can you get one of those? Up? We're going to see if they're because some of them weren't loading earlier. So let's see what Ace can pull up here for us. All right, that's fine. So Hope Street Garden is located in the west end of York. Mm -hmm. um, it was property that uh, does belong to the Redevelopment Authority. Um, they have nearly 400 properties on their books. A lot of that space, over 300, is green space. Mm -hmm. So green space is available to anybody in York to create gardens. Um, ours is a learning lab, so ours is meant for students of different schools. But um, anybody could stay in a garden for mm -hmm. food or, or whatever they would like. and I'd like to welcome you to another day of discovery. Today we're at the Hope Street Garden and Learning Lab, tucked away in the Salem Square neighborhood of the city of York. We're gonna learn a lot about a wonderful community project that's being taken care of and tended lovingly by students in the city of York. Come on along and learn something. I'm glad that you put yeah. that up there so that was awesome so you could really sort of see that was early on in the mm -hmm. process the garden looks much different now but um, Angie had come out there and really helped us showcase what we were mm -hmm. trying to do so the bed has a the garden has a greenhouse it actually has a pavilion that was built from mm -hmm. many of our um, partners on the project and we actually use that as learning space you can have up to two classrooms in there We've had a lot of green space. We've kept a lot of green space so students can actually go out there and just to run and and to and to learn and to draw and, and write things about gardening. Yeah. We were watching a little bit of it earlier while it was uploading and or downloading whatever. I'm not a tech person. <laughs> but it was really interesting because the woman that was talking talked about, oh, we can they can grow the food, they can take this healthy food home and it's a way to encourage healthier habits. Well, I think so. that was probably the thing that I was most impressed with is uh, I knew that parents, once we had put gardening uh, you know, in the community, that parents would eventually start doing it. But really after the first year, we had five parents begin their own gardens. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things that we're looking at is that there's a great deal of disparity um, in urban areas, not just York, this would be any urban areas, it has mm -hmm. to do with you know, our infrastructure, there's not really grocery stores. We have one in York City, you know, on the East End. Um, where our people were not really utilizing our markets for a very long mm -hmm. time because food stamps were not accepted. But food stamps are accepted now at our markets and people should go there and buy mm -hmm. fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, a lot of times our residents are not using the same doctor. A lot of times they're using the emergency room. Um, and that creates all this different disparity and then it's generational and so we see a lot of times our parents are working uh, two three jobs in the community and the older siblings might be the ones who are preparing meals and so they're purchasing things at Turkey Hill or a corner store mm -hmm. versus really having that fresh fruits and vegetables so you have to teach people how to grow it mm 
-hmm. And then what do you do with it? Like, I mean, one of the biggest things was squash. We, you can produce a lot of squash, mm -hmm. but not a lot of people know what to do with squash. Yeah. And so that, that's that been very interesting to see that. But um, um, all of the students who've participated at Hope Street have improved in science, which is great because nationally, uh, science is on the decline in high school. And we really need to turn that around because mm -hmm. that's your doctors, your scientists, that's, you know, it's everything. It's a lot of education the other one needs mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is an important, it's an important subject. It's a really important subject. Math, sciences get lost in the shuffle a lot. Um, and also with the, with, the ad, with the advent of calculators and computers, you, people tend to be using those rather than actually using the brain power. So to get them in there, actually, actually working with a living plant. Because mm -hmm. I think that's very therapeutic. I have house plants all over the place. And mm -hmm. I, think, I think, I just think plants are very, very therapeutic. So yeah. One of the best, uh, best, one of the best things ever said to me by a teacher, a kindergarten teacher, was he said, you know, it's one thing I've been teaching this lesson on roots for years, mm -hmm. and he said, but it wasn't until we walked down to the garden and we pulled a plant out of the ground, mm -hmm. and the kids were like roots, like all of a mm -hmm. sudden that really made sense to them, and and we've seen uh, different improvements all around. I I'm very interested in kinetic learning, hands-on learning. Mm -hmm. If you look across um, urban areas, which is what I'm most familiar with, you know, we're still, the academic levels are still very low. You know, schools are not having much proficiency in reading above 40%. Mathematics is very low as well. Mm -hmm. But you can see that our school day has gotten longer, our school year has gotten longer, and yet it really has not equated to better academics. And so I'm really interested in looking at things that are holistic like the garden. Uh, I like to look at things like technology because it is a digital age. Mm -hmm. I went to see robotics not too long ago and, and I really feel like in many cases we're not even speaking the right language to students in schools mm -hmm. right now because uh, what they need to know and what we're teaching are not necessarily the same thing. Yeah, and I think too we don't look at it, we don't, we're not looking at it as a systemic. No. We need to look more at the systemics because I hear, you know, there's this, I just love this movement towards a trauma-informed care. Mm. And I, I talked to someone uh, just a little while ago, she's been a, she's a retired teacher, and I'm not sure which school it is, but one of the schools is now, they're, they're doing more of a, they're not calling it trauma-informed care, but that's basically what it is. So, you know, for example, instead of, and I know you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about, but if a child is late every day to school or late to class every day and that the teachers just you know well you know now you have to have a detention because you're late well there might be a reason why they're late and when they start looking at why they're late maybe they're late because the bully is blocking their way mm -hmm. and they can't get by that bully until five minutes after class starts yeah. and it's not so they're not actually they're not actually doing it to misbehave they're doing it out of more of a survival and fear mm -hmm. and I think that's wonderful when they start looking at instead of just passing a judgment like that's a bad kid or it's a stupid kid or a lazy kid or whatever I, I hope yeah. that in all of our schools and, and I believe that this is true across your city mm -hmm. and your county I believe that the the language when it comes to talking about students has changed drastically and, and I hope that that's the case in all the schools because um, I've always fundamentally believed that every child I've ever met has come to school with a desire to be successful. I, I've never met a single child in 20 years of teaching and, and 10 years before that of coaching. I've never met a student who did not want to be successful, but they don't all come equipped with the things, same things to mm -hmm. be successful. I mean, you bring up the example of being late to school, and, and I think all schools have a, a portion of students who are late. Um, the best professionals are looking further at the reason why because there's always a reason why and, and even when we see the students sometimes who are causing a disruption there's always a reason why mm -hmm. and so I think that uh, any we have um, worked in that way for a long time connecting the resources with the parents and really finding out what's going on um, schools are responsible to bring a lot more services than they needed to at one time mm -hmm. and that continues to go up so 
I think when I look at that piece of it, I mean, our funding needs to match that, and, and for a long time it hasn't. So the kids need more, but not necessarily is there more funding, mm -hmm. and it needs to be more equalized across from city to county, and from city to city, and from, of course, state to state. And, and we don't have that right now. And that does cause another disparity. Mm -hmm. And so that is what we're looking at. We look at a lot of the Maslow's needs, the basic needs, mm -hmm and try to figure out what do children need um, in order to be able to be successful in education. Um, food is one of those things. Mm -hmm. Feeling of safety mm -hmm. would be one of those things. Uh, a higher purpose yeah. <laughs> would be one of those things. So I think that's, it. the schools who get it um, should be having those conversations and I'm glad to hear that there's more schools who are now having those conversations and, and looking deeper. Yeah. And you know, about two weeks ago, I was in Harrisburg for a, a Housing is Health Coalition. They mm -hmm. were they did a, a, a press conference, and then we went around to the different legislators and talked about how important uh, housing is to someone's health. And then the next day, we there was a, a whole um, we there was a whole uh, conference and mm -hmm. workshops, and I they actually one of the speakers was the uh, the secretary of human services mm. ted dallas and i had an opportunity to just talk for him with him a few minutes after he was done with his presentation and i asked him i said has anyone you know any group have they ever done like a forensic accounting mm. of how much money they're throwing away basically versus if they implemented some of these programs that maybe initially would cost a million dollars to implement the program, but over a course of five years might save five, five, you know, five million dollars. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that he said was that, you know, every, so many of the legislators have their pet projects and what they want. And, and one of the things that we talked about was, there was a woman there also who, who was advocating for dental care because dental care is really lacking. Right. And a lot of the welfare, the program, medic, medical system, such, they don't really include dental care. Mm -hmm. And the point was that when you have a child in a classroom, it can be the highest tech classroom in the world, but if that child's sitting there and they're hungry, they can't see because they don't have glasses, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they can't hear because they maybe need some kind of a hearing aid or something, they're, they're not feeling well because they're not getting proper care, mm -hmm. their teeth hurt, whatever the issue is, maybe, you know, they're, they're worried about when they go home that night, is mom or dad going to be, are they going to, what kind of mood are they going to be in? Have they been drinking? Is, mm -hmm. you know, is mom or dad, or is there going to be someone there that's going to harm them? Mm -hmm. They can't learn. Right. So we really need, and as you're saying, it's absolutely right, because we really need that funding to address this systemic issue and build from the bottom up and get to that, that hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. and start there and give them what they need. No, I agree with that. I had worked uh, prior to the last five years of uh, focusing in on the larger community movement. I had focused in on the parenting movement for nearly five years. and. Uh, you know, our parents, are, I believe, in New York are very dedicated to their children and work hard, are committed to, you know, education, but we can only give what we've been given. Mm -hmm. And we only can tell and teach what we've been taught. And so when I look at really what's going on in, in our community, when I, when I look at education and equity, um, this is long-term disparity. Mm -hmm. This did not occur over a year. Um, it's not going to be changed in a year. Right. A single person is mm -hmm. not going to change it. But when you bring the right people together, mm -hmm. um, housing and, and your food, and you bring your health care together, and York is doing a lot of that. Actually, we have a lot of that going on. And, and I feel that we're very close. First off, I do believe we are in a movement of equity. And I, I believe that we are picking up momentum every day. Mm -hmm. and, and the more that we talk about it, the more that's the case. You will start to turn these corners, but it, it is absolutely going to be through education. I believe it's going to be through our elementary mm -hmm. schools. I do not, um, I think almost that when we've allowed someone, I mean, I don't think it's ever too late, but when we start to try to put these changes in, when somebody's in their early 20s, a lot of these behaviors, these disparities have taken hold. Mm -hmm. 
where if we get ahead of them, and, and I'm all about proactive. Right. I, I don't put a lot of energy into I being agree. reactive. I agree, 100%. Yeah. Say it all the time, yeah. you know, we need to be more proactive. So, need to be more proactive. Yeah. I want to be ahead of something. I agree. And so that's where mm -hmm. I have found that we've made the most progress, mm -hmm. and I believe that's where, um, and I believe that there's other educators in New York who are, are absolutely working towards that, and, um, and on all of our schools. Mm -hmm. Um, you now, at one time, you did not, not all students got a breakfast at school, even though it was offered. Some came late, and, and that would cause a disparity in that. Some of the schools, 100% of the kids get a breakfast now because it's delivered to the classroom. Mm -hmm. All of our children get free lunch pretty much in New York City, but now all of our schools have the snack program. Well, that's something we didn't have two years ago. Most of our schools now have um, after-school programming and the dinner program. Well, a couple years ago, that was not the case. So I, I think that when we focus in on a single disparity, great change has occurred. And the gardens have come up all over on New York. We are a much more gardening city than we mm -hmm. were five years ago. I think that as we continue to start zoning in, just like you said about this care that they're going to put in, well, we're going to see a change in that because that's where what's going to change is where we always put our energy. Mm -hmm. And, and I love that, and, I, and I'm proud of our city for bringing that because we should do that. We should have care for, our, for all ages, for our youngest children to our senior citizens. Everybody needs care, and they need to live in a community that they feel people care about them and that they know where to go. And York is rich in resources. Mm -hmm. We have always been. We yeah. are rich in mm -hmm. resources, more so than many places. But I think that our largest problem is our lack of communication. People um, don't always, uh, some of us in work, we don't always talk to each other the way we should. Mm -hmm. And we certainly um, don't always communicate out effectively um, where these services are. And so someone new coming to York would have a very hard time mm -hmm. finding these resources. And I don't, you know, I personally don't always think to say, well, the food bank's right there, or the housing place is right there, or that church gives that, or that school has that, and we need to be better at that. As a community, we need yeah. to be better. Yeah, we need to be better, and, and the thing that I see is myself going to, as, as just a person off the street, going into the different committees, like I, I'm very involved with the Continuum of Care, which mm. is the county organization that addresses homelessness. And I am literally almost across the board always the only private person there, only private. You know, everyone <laughs> yeah. else is a professional, yes. or you know, involved in, in some in some way in the mm -hmm. field, but I'm the only one there. And I keep telling people over and over and over again, you need to get involved. Now I understand maybe you know work or whatever gets in the way that you can't get involved as much, but it doesn't matter. Even just going to the city council meetings, mm -hmm. going to the commissioners' meetings, going, you know, any of these meetings, and there's a lot of meetings. The budget every year, the budget meeting, the for the mm -hmm. um, human services has every year uh, Jessica Mockaby and Michelle Havis. Every year they have this budget meeting. Mm -hmm. Every year it's, you know, they have. Hardly mm -hmm. no one from the community coming. It's all professionals, it's all administrators, and, and staff members. But you know, this is our budget. Mm -hmm. You know, this is they and they want you to come. That's the thing that they want you to come. Mm -hmm. And I have people, you know, I have people asking me all the time because I go to these different things. So I. I know resources. Mm -hmm. I know, and and you're absolutely right. I have heard what you've said. I have heard so. If I had a nickel for every time I had heard <laughs> what you just said, I would I would be I would have a fortress at this point. <laughs> I would have the mansion, yeah. because it really is difficult for I don't know why, but it just seems like such a difficult thing for all these organizations to hook up mm -hmm. and and communicate. Well, I think that's part of the your culture. I mean, I've lived here my whole life. And, uh, and that is part of our culture, unfortunately. We had, um, with my work with uh, the National Leadership for Public Health, our coach came here from Atlanta, and, mm -hmm. she, and there was many things that she uh, loved about York. And I think the person who's probably doing it the best right now would be our mayor, because uh, she said exactly what our, she's doing exactly what our coach said from the NLPH. Mm -hmm. She said, first off, as leaders, you are responsible to make space at tables for people. So what you're describing is they are making space for people. Mm -hmm. And then when 
they don't come to your table, you need to create a new table. Mm -hmm. So when our mayor took city council or city hall, uh, city hall tour to different locations throughout your, mm -hmm. um, that's exactly what we need to do. It is exactly. So it's not just fair for me to say, well, I had the meeting and no one came. Mm -hmm. Maybe the traditional meeting that we've been used to having, um, we need to take somewhere else. And, and maybe that literally is on the street. Maybe literally that is in the church um, because it's not going to happen on Pleasant Acres Road. And, I, and I'm not bashing them because right. I appreciate them. Yeah. I, I don't want them to think I don't like. But I mean, who is going there? Mm -hmm. And literally, who knows when that meeting would be? Like, you know, so I, yeah. so I, I love that our coach told us that. And, and I took that to heart. I took it to heart. Number one, it is my responsibility to create space at a table. Mm -hmm. And that might mean me picking somebody up saying come on come to this meeting and you do belong here and you mm -hmm. do need to speak here and, and keep saying that and two when that doesn't happen uh, I need to create new tables and so I, I, I appreciate the people who are I see um, bringing the services to the people and there's some new work around that with the career fairs that have gone mm -hmm. on that was very impressive I know that the career links is trying to think and work on some satellite thing inside the city. I think that's fantastic. Um, I love that the health department will come out and do education everywhere. Like those are the things that uh, impress me mm -hmm. because I'm a city resident and, and when I see them uh, in the West End or set up in the East End, mm -hmm. then I'm like, that's exactly what we should be doing. Yeah, and we need to be supporting those people that do that as well. Sure, of course yeah. we do. I, mean, I have. One one of my guests, Dr. Sherry Kim, she's been on maybe three times now, and I was talking about her a little bit earlier before the show. She has uh, an agency out on George Street, South George, and she has her her it's nonprofit, and her um, you know, mission statement, I guess you would say, is mental health for all, regardless mm -hmm. of the ability to pay. So she and she purposely chose that location as pretty much the center of the city so that people can get there. That's wonderful. Because if you're homeless, you know, you can't, mm -hmm. you know, you can't go out to Dover, you know. Yeah, easily. that's right. So, that's right. you know, so she's right there. And she also works with the Jefferson Women's Shelter. Mm -hmm. She works with them. She works with, um, I think she's partnering with the, um, the, the New York Rescue Mission. I believe she's partnering with them, um, helping victims of human trafficking. Mm -hmm. She's been doing a lot of these things and you know the other week she was having issues against funding. She had the the state owed money for services that she supplied. They weren't paying. She was in danger of shutting down. Well luckily uh, Representative Shriver's office did get involved in that and they helped her. That's so wonderful. but you know it was touch and go there for a while and, I honestly you know. think that anybody who's providing services um, mm -hmm. it's touch and go at different times for them and, and I wish that would be the one thing that would change is that funding should be in certain areas like mental health and education there should be some um, levelization of that because it's really not fair to you know delay payments and I'm, I'm not sure why you know that happened but I can honestly tell you that CBC was affected this past year mm -hmm. by that. Um, the educational, all the schools were affected mm -hmm. um, by that one, one degree or the other. But I think that's one of those things that I would like to see us have a better voice in because I mean, we, we are the ones who elect people to different offices. And when this goes on, if our voice is not in the room, then this is gonna continue to go mm -hmm. on. You know, so again, we have to, where we put our energy and our voice is where our services are going to go and where support's going to go. And um, So I would like to see that improved as well because um, we need those services and we definitely need them within the city limits. Yeah. And if someone's doing good work, if they can prove that they're doing good work, then we should be supporting them. Mm -hmm. But I can see that most change that has occurred, and I always say this about, about even the work that I've done, every project I've ever taken on, I've had zero budget. I've never had a budget on a single project, and yet it didn't stop me from doing the project. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that money is always the answer, and I think a lot of people are like, oh, if I had a million dollars, I could do this program. But I want people to find their passion, their single thing that they can chip away mm -hmm. at these different things, and I want them to 
find solutions without looking for uh, a check because that check may never come. But you will force yourself to actually work with people who can bring a piece of that. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like to see us do more of that because when um, I was building Hope Street Garden, I, I didn't have any money. I still, I, still, yeah. I built a whole large garden, I still have no money. <laughs> so, but what I did have was I had the ability to um, speak to the right people mm -hmm include the right people and, um, and and not tell them what I wanted them to do but ask them what are you willing to do which I think we need to be um, ask things differently mm -hmm. and I think we need to be in a place of gratitude with people if people are doing the right thing and they are supporting you you should say thank you mm -hmm. and maybe more than once you know maybe daily yes you know <laughs> because yes. that goes a long that. way mm -hmm. with people is having gratitude and um, I hope one day that you can come over and see the garden because it's much, I'd love to see it's it. much different now than yeah. when we started and I'm really proud of that and it continues to change. Yeah, I love that and I think what you're saying is absolutely, I agree 100%. It's the, I have, I've, I've learned this sort of as I've gone along in life that, you know, just because somebody says no doesn't mean they don't want to help you. Oh, absolutely. Just, you know, they, they can say no that they can't do. If you ask them something and they say no, then maybe rephrase it and say, okay, well, is there anything that you could do? Is there any, you know, can I, with your schedule, maybe you need to work with their schedule a little differently. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need to ask the question yeah. a little differently. And, yes, please and thank yous and you're welcome go a long way. They do they go, go a long way. way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, everyone wants to feel appreciated. Yes. You know, including the children. I think especially the children, I, I think that, you know, I've, I've had some success working with children at different levels, and I think that's because I, I believe that we should build from where everybody's at, and I, not just children, adults as well, mm -hmm. but we have to build from where people are, and we can build them to where they need to go. But I, I have honestly, and I mean this sincerely, there's never been a child, ever, and the thousands and thousands of children I've worked with, there's never been a single child that I haven't found something sincerely that I loved about them. And mm -hmm. I mean that. That every single child I've met, no matter if they were zero, you know, just born, or yeah. um, our, and our teenagers, because I think they're our children too, so, you know, I feel like that mm -hmm. about them. Um, not a single child that I've not looked at and thought, you know what, I really like that about them. And um, I've really have been proud of myself for that. Now I've had to work very hard to feel that way about adults. Mm -hmm. And I've gone a lot better with that. That now I have sort of that nurturing feeling towards adults, which I didn't always have. Mm -hmm. uh, that took me many years to develop and to have empathy for adults because I always thought everybody should be equipped at the same level as an adult. And that's really not the case at all. And so that has been a lot of work for me mm -hmm. is to really see adults where are they? And, and my work with um, parents really helped me be able to do that over the years, is to meet people where they are. But uh, that's something I think as a community we have struggled with, and, and I know I personally have struggled with, is that we expect a lot from our adults sometimes, and, and really humans are fragile people. We're much more fragile than we think people are, and, um, and we need to care for people much more than we do. Yeah. And I'm still working on that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is hard. It's very hard because I think I always use the example of the college professor that knows, you know, they, they know physics and they know it so well. They think the students should know it too. And they can't understand, why don't you get this? It's so easy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's e yeah, it's easy for you, but it's not easy for everyone else. And mm -hmm. I think the best professors are those that or teachers in general and even other people that get you get along much better if you can take a step back and try to look at it through that person's eyes because what what happened to them what was their experience why are they doing this even some i mean i'm you know we're just i was bashing trump earlier but you know what 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 happened to him to make him that way well that's a, that's an excellent question and something what was his educational experience yeah something yeah. had to happen something did i would agree with you had I, mean, I think it's a good example yeah i think to understand too that you know uh um we continue to grow mm -hmm. you know all of us all of us elevate and change you know none of us are going to be the people that we were when we were 10 or 18 or 25 and and that's what we're supposed to do we're supposed to get more polished and we're supposed to get a better heart 
and become more educated. I find that the best teachers I have known have two things in common. Um, most of them have done something prior to teaching. Mm -hmm. So they've had another career. They haven't just been an educator, they've also been something else. And the second thing is uh, coaches. Coaches who become educators or um, educators who were in some type of organized sport seem to be fantastic teachers mm -hmm. because they want to know how to break down learning. It doesn't matter it doesn't matter if they're teaching reading or math or science. Mm -hmm. They really are able to break things down into an organized manner and teach it systematically, which is critical no matter what the subject is. Um, two, there are sort of like cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. They make everybody feel good, right? Yeah. You know, I'm going to cheer for you. And, and I had a couple years that I was teaching learning support, and, and I can tell you it was the hardest two years of teaching I had. And I remember saying to that student, um, who is now a senior year guy, I will not say his name to embarrass him, <laughs> but uh, he is a, a football player. He's a great student now. But I remember saying to him, I will believe until you believe. Mm -hmm. And I had to mean it. And it took us about six months to turn a corner. So, and that was, he was then in fifth grade. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things did not go right that we yeah. ended up having that conversation in fifth grade. But I think we should never give up on our students. And, um, and it's never too late to turn it around for children. And, you know, gardening is, can be that. Technology can be that. The arts are that music is that so that's why these things are so important to enrich kids and have a holistic approach because you never know what's going to tie them in to school and make them think you know what I can do it I can be somebody yeah that was one of the things that in the trauma-informed care conference that I talked about a little earlier mm -hmm. The, the keynote speaker was a woman named Tanya Kane. Have you heard of Tanya? No. Okay, Tanya Kane was, she's a, she's a woman who, her background, she was arrested, I think, like 80-some 80, 80 times, had like 60-some convictions, had, uh, had been horribly abused as a child, mm -hmm. lived on the streets, was homeless. And her, she talks about all these experiences, and at the very end of her presentation, she shows a picture, a mugshot of her, and she challenges the people in the room, the case managers, the social workers. She said, now, you know, I walked into your room, like that person walked right. into your room. What would you think? Would you think yeah. that that person was worth anything? Could they do anything? And then she said, do you think that that person could become this? And then the next shot is her walking the red carpet of all things this beautiful rainbow gown, you know, pretty makeup, you know, really, mm -hmm. really just complete opposite of what the mugshot right. was. And she now has a, a huge nonprofit, has a television show. She goes all around the world teaching people about trauma. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, but here's someone that all her life she was written off. Yeah. She said she she said and all the time that she went through that system, no one ever asked her what happened to you that that is causing you to do this? What you know? What is the? What's wrong? What's happening? You know, it was it was just like yeah, you're a drug addict. Yeah, you're a prostitute. Whatever. My one of my dearest colleagues, um, had, what she says, and I love this. She said, "I have become the educator that I needed to have," and I that is so powerful mm -hmm. to me. That, that she, you know, that she's saying she has become the woman that she needed to have mm -hmm. when she was a child and there was nobody there for her. And I love that. I always ask people, I always ask people what was their turning point. And, and I can, if you, cha if people change nothing um, in their life, if they stop and ask people, what was your turning point? I think that they would be amazingly surprised. Mm -hmm. Because somebody, if you ever see people, somebody working in great purpose, something there was a specific time that turned their work from being just ordinary to extraordinary mm -hmm. and every person I've seen have done extraordinary work has always had a pivotal moment and there's always been pivotal people involved and so I really believe that our words are extremely powerful I know people say that on time but much greater than we believe that they are and I believe that we can absolutely rise you know help people rise up and we can absolutely take people out and destroy them with our words especially our children mm -hmm. and so uh, I always try to speak with kindness 
I, w- I work on that too. But I mean, I do always try to speak with God. I'm not saying I'm perfect because I'm certainly not. And I have those moments, but I love to hear the people who have turned a corner mm-hmm. and then they've used that to help other people. We can only really judge people where we meet them at. That's true. You know, and I think that sometimes that the people, you know, carry their own baggage around and they think everybody knows, but really, we don't know. We meet people where they are and we just think in our minds that's the person they've always been. Mm-hmm. And so you're right, sometimes we do have to stop and say, how did you end up here? Yeah. <laughs> and what were your experiences? Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why they're looking at changing the criminal justice system because so many people are being punished way after the fact. You know, maybe they did something dumb or they did something, for whatever reason, something happened Mm -hmm. and it wasn't a good thing that happened. But, you know, they can change. People can and do change. Absolutely. People do change all the time. Exactly. So you you, you need to meet them where they are now and not focus so much on, well, what did they do back then? Yeah. I think that we should focus more on people's light altogether. Mm-hmm. I, I have some some new ideas that I would like to do some work on, uh, and, and really does have to do with the criminal justice system. As I I do fundamentally believe that there's people that have light in them in all uh, venues, mm-hmm. and so there are people that even in uh, jail who are protectors, and who are you know even though they're they're incarcerated themselves, mm-hmm. are bringing hope to other people. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that we really have looked at that the way that I would like to see us. In, and I would like to do some work specifically in that, just because I think there's people that bring light everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I would like to see us do more work around that as a, as a community, as a country, uh, because you're right. We cannot continue to write off people. We continue to build more jails, and yet, you know, our jails are outnumbering our schools right. in some ways. And, you know, what we're mm-hmm. spending in our incarceration system mm-hmm. isn't even compared to what we're spending in education. It's like nothing. And so, I mean, we definitely have that real wrong. And, and we have to start taking, we have to start taking on some hard conversations that make us feel uncomfortable. And, um, you know, nobody wants it to be their fault, but it's everybody's fault a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, and everybody has to somewhat take some responsibility because when you don't stop, and ask that woman or any child, what's going on? How did you end up here? I mean, you're you're just allowing it to keep going and going, and we need somebody to put on the brakes with this yeah. whole system. And the and you're right; these conversations are difficult. They're they are. conversations. You know, we have a situation right now with Mayor Wasco, and you know, and and you know, I'm kind of looking at these things though, and trying to look at it from a different perspective. And like, well, you know, maybe it is a good thing though that some of these things are happening. They're horrible. But also, they're they're forcing people to now talk. They're forcing mm-hmm. people to re-examine what's going on in our well, country. Well, I think that you know it's unfortunate when he said, of course, mm-hmm. you know everybody's you know appalled by it. But the, truthfully, I think the victory is in how it's been handled. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, I, I have seen their- I've seen many of the people that I consider friends who've gone out there and who you know are not from West Shore, but they have certainly gone out mm-hmm. there and they are supporting West Shore. Um, I feel that their city council is engaged in the conversation, mm-hmm. and I know it's not easy for them, um, but yet they're in the conversation, and, and they've held the doors open many times, mm-hmm. and you know, and that at one time would have never occurred in West York or anywhere outside the city. Mm-hmm. Maybe it wouldn't even have happened in the city at one point. So people are going to, there's always going to be that person who says something ridiculous. That's what our, you know, that's what people do. Mm-hmm. But it's really not in what they say, it is always in how we react. And in this case, uh, West York certainly got the reaction correct, in my opinion. Yeah. I think they've done a great job, and, and I was, uh, I've seen some of those people who are out there supporting, and, and I've told them, I'm really proud of you for doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, I was there at the meeting the other mm-hmm. week, and it was really powerful. And, it, you know, Sean Mock, I believe mm-hmm. his last name's Mock, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've reached out to him, and he's interested in coming on the show, which I think is says a lot about him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had Carla Christopher on the show. And actually, Carla was on the week that that story broke. Mm-hmm. And when she showed me that, it was just, mm-hmm. you know, it was unbelievable. But it's, yeah, it, it, it it's good to see people getting together, supporting each other, starting to talk about mm-hmm. these things, because racism is not just about black. It's, no. it's, it affects all of us. This, to me, 
is uh, I think that one of the reasons that we really need to look at our economics is because this is, you know, this is somebody thinking that they're superior no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It, mm -hmm. It's everything. It's not just one thing, and, and they don't like this person. Well, they're not going to like that person either. Mm -hmm. You know, every week they're going to find somebody new not to like for a reason that's ridiculous, you know, for, for no good reason. We have to take on these conversations of economics, and we have to have better education. We have to have better economics. We have to level these playing fields. Because then, I mean, if somebody's equally educated, if somebody has equal economic opportunity, you may say that about me, but I don't have to accept that, nor is it true. Right. You know, and at some point we have to, you know, I hope, I hope I, this, the mayor does the right thing because he needs to allow his community. I'm Steve Butler. Welcome to the garage. This project, we're going to build these little tea lights. And I utilize my scraps of wood. They have a stainless steel top, some perforated metal. The aluminum comes in a long bar, and it's just aluminum channel that I cut. I drill a hole for the tea light, and that's. 